Hi everybody, this is Craig from the University of Applied Research and Development. I'm delighted to be here for our Educators podcast. I'm here with Dr. Lorraine Ling, who is the Emeritus Professor from La Trobe University. And it's our pleasure to have you with us, Lorraine. Welcome. Thank you, Craig, for inviting me. I'd love for you to share with us just what an Emeritus Professor does and what you did leading up to that as well. Well, an Emeritus Professor has uh, the luxury, actually, of usually being retired and able to do a lot of academic writing they haven't been able to do during their career um, <laughs> because they've been too busy uh, doing lots of other leadership and management roles. So, um, so at the moment, I'm enjoying that luxury of being able to um, catch up with quite a lot of academic writing and, and reading. Uh, but prior to that, I'd spent over 35 years in, um, in higher education. Um, firstly, <coughs> at La Trobe University, where I'm the emeritus, now an emeritus professor. Um, and in those years, I um, had many, many roles. Um, but the final 10 years were spent as executive dean of education in the faculty of education there. Um, and during that time, well, I was actually the first female dean in the 40 years of existence at that point of La Trobe ever to be um, put into a deanship. So I felt that was quite an achievement for, for a leadership role for, for females. Um, they've had many since, of course. Uh, but in that role, I had the responsibility for the education programs across five campuses. Um, of La Trobe University as it covers most of Victoria as well as metropolitan Melbourne. Um, so that, that was an amazing job and uh, I learnt a great deal about leadership and management in that time. At the end of uh, 2014, I retired for the first time um, and uh, um, spent nine months in retirement before being um, being asked by Victoria University in in Melbourne to uh, go into their university as a as a, a, a dean. They had a vacancy, a short term sixteen month vacancy that had to be filled, and they wanted someone to be able to hit the ground running. So um, I went and fulfilled that role for the sixteen months. And at that time, after that, they um, asked me to stay on as the Pro Vice Chancellor Associate because they were going through a massive transformation in the university, as most universities were at that point, um, to try to become more sustainable into the longer term. And so, of course, that meant a lot of curriculum and strategic um, <coughs> change. So my role was um, Pro Vice Chancellor Associate Educational and Strategic Transformation. So I did that for another two years um, before finally retiring for the second time, which at the moment I'm still doing. <laughs> I, I think your, your depth of experience and the breadth of your leadership is really quite phenomenal. So I'd love to hear about some of those challenges in your senior roles that you had to grapple with and, and how you handled them? Well, uh, there are many challenges, of course, but I think uh, every challenge is also a tremendous opportunity. And I suppose the way I always looked at it was that I was quite excited and, and, and quite motivated by, by challenges. In fact, I think um, I th thrived on them, really. Um, many of the challenges involve the leadership side um, and I, I like to um, delineate in some ways leadership from management. Uh, leadership is, is about people, you know, things are managed, people are led is, is always something that I've uh, held very closely to and I feel that um, both of those have to be in good balance. Um, I, I, I was very influenced during my leadership by uh, quite a few writers and theorists, um, but one of the people who wrote a, a little book called Educative Leadership um, quite a while back now, in 1992, but it still rings pretty true, 
um, uh, well, it was written by Dwignan and McPherson, you're probably familiar with it. It's called Educative Leadership. And in that, they make a nice, um, a, a nice kind of a, um, analogy between the notion of a pie graph, really, where you've got the two parts of administration, leadership, management. And uh, they talk about the fact that that needs to be in balance. The leadership side, the people side, where you motivate people, where you bring people along with you, where you have a vision that people can, can buy into and can have some ownership of, where you empower people, where, where you help people, where you're empathetic with people, all of those things I put in the leadership side of one's, one's role. And then there's the management side where you have to deal with the systems and the operations and the rules and the resources and the processes and the procedures. And Dwignan and McPherson draw this nice pie graph where they have those in perfect balance, but then they show what happens if the management side gobbles up the leadership side and it's all about things and not very much about people. Or alternatively, if it's all about people and not very much about things because either way the balance is disrupted. So I've been very conscious of um, trying to balance those two aspects of my role, the leadership and the management role in some way. Um, so it, it was quite challenging in, in, in some elements of the role because there are always what would be called cultural problems that one has to deal with. And I suppose they're the most difficult things to deal with because that's where you come up against the micro politics of organisations where, where you have uh, groups um, of people who are in um, uh, cabals, I suppose, and others who are in cliques. Um, one lot wants change, the other lot doesn't want change. And so you're, you're there trying to make this great balancing act between those two uh, two sorts of culture. So it's always interesting and always fascinating, I think, the way, um, the way leadership goes and the way management has to interact. I was going to ask you, what, what have you found are some of those things that, without knowing it, can move the, the divisions on the pie graph out of whack, as you say, and um, cause management to go too big or administration. You've mentioned culture and cliques or cabals. What are some other things that, that pop up in leadership roles? Um, well, I guess with, um, with culture, with change comes often cultural challenges because obviously we're living in a time when uh, the only constant is change and the only certainty is uncertainty and I think recently we've been made very much more aware of that by the recent pandemic. Um, and so understanding that the only constant is change, one, one goes through many, many, many changes, usually given the, the, the title of restructure. Um, and so, of course, these restructures uh, always bring with them uh, a mass of cultural issues because you've got people who, people who will, by very nature, resist change. People who will go along with it because they are fairly passive about whatever happens, they'll go along with it. And others who will actively enjoy it and revel in it. So you've you've got all of those sorts of forces at work, and. It kind of reminds me of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, little book Intelligent Leadership by Alastair Mant, um, where he talks about people um, who are frog thinkers and people who are bicycle thinkers. And uh, I've always tried to, um, in some way, use this analogy because... For, for thinking about the way an organisation works when we're in periods of change particularly. And Alistair Mant uh, used this analogy of people who have bicycle brains, being able to see all the parts of the organisation, being able to see the detail of an organisation. 
being able to see that you can take an organisation apart, like you can take a bike apart, you can, you can replace bits, you can even modify bits, put it back together and it works. And some people see that as an organisation. Other people who have got frog thinking see it as an, an organism, a, a, a kind of a living organic being, if you like. And, of course, if, if you start, uh, frogs are adaptive for a while. If you start removing bits, they'll adapt for a period of time. But ultimately, if you keep removing bits of a frog because the connections aren't there, because they can't interact, because the body can't function in the way it should, the frog will get sick and it will die. So he uses this to describe institutions and the way people think about and, and manage institutions. They either see them in this bicycle way so they can just cut bits off or put bits back and in a different way and it'll still work. But if you see an organisation in all its organic connection and the fact that you can't just keep taking bits off and expect it still to work, um, I, I, th I think that helps. So I've often uh, sat in meetings and amused myself sometimes categorising people into frog brain and, and bicycle brain people. <laughs> and, of course, in an organisation we act Actually need we need both thinking we need the detail people but we also need the people who can see the connections um, I think that's particularly important in restructures because we when I was uh, going through this um, transformation process at um, Victoria University it was really important to be able to see the connections between uh, between all of the units that go to make up a course the course that go to make up a, a, a degree and, you know, you can't just keep taking bits out um, unless you can see the connections and what that's going to do to the body as a whole. So that's, that's been one thing that's influenced me, I suppose, through, throughout my many challenges of, of management. But as I say, I've enjoyed every, every challenge. Just for those people who want to follow up on that, you said Intelligent Leadership by, by Matt. Alistair, Alistair Mant. Alistair um, Mant, M-A-T. He did a lot of work as a, in, in, um, in England. Um, he was responsible for totally restructuring the BBC and um, he criticises the fact that uh, British Rail went through a whole restructure but it was totally run by bicycle brain people uh, with the result that it didn't really work terribly well as a result right that's fascinating um, I was reading your profile and I saw that you have recently written a book uh, methods and paradigms in education research how about you tell us about that right well during my time as an academic I supervised um, tens and tens and tens of uh, probably 50 or more postgraduate students undertaking either masters or PhDs and whenever I was um, working with those students I looked at many I've tried to refer them to many research books but very few mentioned the importance of the paradigm in in research that is the worldview that you bring to the particular research that you're doing, your motivation for doing it, you, you, the ontology you have, what you believe about seeking the truth or looking for multiple meanings and all of those kinds of things. So I was always trying to find how I could explain this paradigm notion and the importance of either working in a positivist paradigm where you're looking for a tr truth or an interpretive paradigm where you're looking for multiple meanings or indeed an emancipatory paradigm where you're looking to bring about some change through your research. And so I, I um, determined that when I had the time and the luxury of the time, I would actually put together a book on paradigms and methods of education and how it was so important that you determine the paradigm within in your, which you're working because once you've done that, 
the methodology and the methods and the way you collect your data and the way you analyse your data and the conclusions, the way you come to your conclusions is, is already largely mapped out for you because you know the, the world view and the values and the axiology and the ontology and all of those other ologies that you bring to it. So you said interpretive, emancipatory, and what was the other one you mentioned? Positivist. So we go go through, um, in our book, we go through the positivist approach, which is there is a truth and that truth is knowable, uh, to the post-positivist, which would temper that by saying, well, there you can find patterns, but you have to understand that there could be changes in those patterns. So they, they, they are softening that very hard line of the positivists. Then you come to the interpretivist where we're looking for multiple meanings. We're looking for the perspectives, the multiple meanings people bring, and through those multiple meanings we're able to describe, analyse and... Um, give some sort of overview of, you know, an event or whatever it is you're researching. The pragmatic approach, which is another one, says I have to find, usually this is very popular in consultancy work and when you're doing research for um, an external funding body because they want a particular outcome. And so what you have to do in the pragmatic pragmatic view is find the research uh, approach and methodology that's going to best get you as the researcher to be able to achieve that outcome. So that's the pragmatic one. And you might use a whole range of different methodologies as things change within a research project. So that's another paradigm. Then there's the emancipatory paradigm, which is the one where you work with often with marginalised or disadvantaged groups, and they become almost co-researchers with you uh, to, to uncover what it is that is the cause or the, the um, root cause of their problem and help them to find ways to get through that. And by, by that, you're bringing about change or emancipation. Um, and, and then we added a another one based on the work of um, Ronald Barnett who's written about super complexity. Uh, Ronald Barnett talks about the fact that we live in a super complex world where um, it's not only complex, it's super complex because the frames of reference by which we try to kind of make sense of our world are themselves conflicted and breaking and, and falling apart and I think COVID-19 has been an excellent example of super complexity where we've got total uncertainty and unknowns and strange and awkward spaces. Uh, and so working on his premise of super complexity, we've added our paradigm uh, based on his notion, which is the paradigm of super complexity, where, where you go into research with the premise that there are unknowables and maybe what you're doing is uncovering more unknowables. You're imagining, you're using creative ways to try to look at things anew, and you're understanding this whole notion that things are fragile and, and changeable and in, um, unstable. So that's, in a nutshell, what the paradigms are that we talk about and we say dependent on which of those you you are undertaking your research in so so will your methodologies and the way you proceed with that research study be determined the next course that our master's students are moving into for their masters in education is researching the teacher's practice and so would okay. there be a particular paradigm that would be more suitable to reflect on one's own practice or as a leader to pick a teacher and to reflect on their practice? Or is it anything? Um, no. Well, again, it depends. If, if, if a, that person going into that research thinks there is a truth about the way teachers perform, 
and the way about there is a truth about what constitutes good practice, best practice, then they might be up the post positivist end. If, however, they believe that there are multiple different ways that, that you approach teaching as a classroom teacher, multiple different approaches that you can have to teaching and learning, and what they want to do is get a, a grasp of how different people perceive their role as a teacher or know more about reflecting on how they themselves perceive their role, they'd be very much in the interpretivist um, camp, really. Um, if, if they see that through teaching, and this would be particularly if they were working with marginalised or disadvantaged groups of learners, then you may well see the research that you do and the teaching that you do as part of a process of of emancipating or empowering those those uh, learners, so they may well be right up that end where they're trying through their research to bring about real change. So you know that's it's the mental, it's what you bring the mental kind of uh, frame of of reference that you bring to your research that determines the paradigm that you'll be functioning in. And, of course, my, the other point we make is that we shouldn't see that we're either doing qualitative or we're either doing quantitative research. When people say, um, what, what, um, what are you doing? Uh, and they say, oh, I'm doing a qualitative research study. In fact, the paradigm is more important We've got qualitative and we've got quantitative. The difference in how we use those two very important methodologies is determined by the paradigm. Because I've, if I'm in the positivist paradigm, then I will certainly use more quantitative than I will qualitative because I'm looking for cause and effect. I'm looking for truth. And therefore, I, I want, want hard facts and figures. And I might use some qualitative to describe those facts and figures. But predominantly, I'd be quantitative. If I'm in the interpretivist paradigm, <clears throat> I'd be using probably predominantly qualitative. But if I really want to influence policymakers, which I would, I'd want to have a quantitative dimension because policymakers are not going to read 12 case studies. Right. They're, they're going to want a page of facts. So um, I would always inject some sort of mixed method there. And likewise, if I'm in the emancipatory, again, you'd be more qualitative because you're wanting to gain people's thoughts and perceptions and opinions. But... Again, if you want to influence change, have some quantitative dimensions in there. And I think education as a, as a, as a um, discipline has done itself a disservice for many years by being so predominantly qualitative without having some quantitative dimension that really gives the policymakers something to hang on to. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say it's it's starting with the end in mind? It's it's well, it's coming to it with yes. The end is really important. What are the outcomes you want to achieve? Now, obviously, you can't predetermine what you're going to find. <laughs> um, so that it, I, I liken doing research to writing a mystery novel. You know, you you, you start out with a plot, <clears throat> but sometimes that 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 plot sort of takes on a life of its own as you go on and you're really not totally sure you get there what the end's going to be. You know, one of those create your own mysteries that they used to have when my children were, were young. You'd buy a book and you'd read up to a certain point and then they'd say, now, you create your own ending. Uh, research is a bit like that, you know. You've, you, you never know until you've done the research what the actual end product is going to be. But you can have a view 
of the kind of end product you want? Do you want to change things? Do you want to find patterns and order? Or do you want to know what multiple meanings there are that can be applied to a situation? So, yes, knowing knowing where you're coming from when you go into research and what you want to achieve at the end is very important. Dr Lorraine, in the last few minutes that we have left, uh, for those people that are aspiring leaders or leaders thinking about moving or changing or stepping up, it just rings in my mind that you said you've had many, many challenges, but you've enjoyed them all. What would you say is a quality a leader should develop in themselves or experiences they should seek out as they're aspiring to lead or lead on a greater platform? Well, first of all, I suppose there are some qualities that I would that I would highlight, um, which would be uh, to be genuine, to be authentic, and to be yourself, um, and to be decisive. Um, I think that's really important, and I've always used the um, uh, the thought that what I want to be is authoritative, but clearly not authoritarian. Um, and I think that's about decisiveness. I think it's about, and the other thing, I think you have to be prepared um, in all of these challenging situations to make the hard decisions, to make the tough decisions, um, and not to shy away from them because weak and indecisive leadership is always going to filter right down through any organisation and cause major problems because people will start to make the rules for themselves and find ways around things they don't want to do and the whole organism, the bicycle or the frog, <laughs> falls apart. So <clears throat> it's really important <clears throat> that you're able to make those tough decisions but not only that you're able to make the decision but that you're able to provide a, a reasoning to the people that you are responsible to and answerable to and leading <clears throat> as to why you've made those decisions. <clears throat> it's what I suppose many theorists would call being able to articulate discursively your reasons for doing things. And I've always thought that was very important. If I don't have the ability to articulate discursively to anybody above me or below me why I've made a decision I have, then I need to rethink that decision. It's really important. <clears throat> I also think <clears throat> um, you need to seek out <clears throat> opportunities to empower other people <clears throat> because as a leader, you can't empower other people unless you yourself feel empowered. And by disempowering other people, you effectively disempower yourself. So that circle of power that, that, that Foucault talked about many years ago, that circle of power is really important, I think. But, but in this case, I, I'm thinking, give others, others the opportunity to show their particular talents you need to get to know the group, and I suppose I would say one of the things aspiring leaders need to do is to know the, know the group with whom they're working so that they can utilise the talents and the strengths that those people bring. Um, and and that's, that's really, really important because otherwise people <clears throat> don't get that sense of, <coughs> excuse me, of empowerment and without that, you as a leader are significantly weakened. <clears throat> the other thing we have to do is, as, as leaders, we need to have trust. <clears throat> if we give people tasks, we need to trust them to do it. We need to allow them to do it. <clears throat> and then if they don't do it, that's when we need to come in and work with them. But the trust has to be there. And it has to be a mutual trust. Um, I, I would also um, believe that <clears throat> the empathy is really important because when people are going through change, people, as I've said, have various reactions to change. 
And there are three kinds of change that uh, we can have. We can have the top-down change where we drop the change on people and <clears throat> there are sanctions if they don't do what is required. We have the what's called rational empiric change. And I was just listening then to <clears throat> something on the television um, about um, COVID and how they're trying to get people to um, obey the restrictions. And they were appealing to logic. Well, often we'll appeal to logic. It's called rational empiric leadership, where during a period of extreme change or dislocation, we often try to appeal to the logic and try to persuade people that what we want them to do is a good idea. But what we overlook at that point is that people are often overcome with emotion and fear and apprehension and all kinds of other things in these sorts of situations. And they're not necessarily all that logical and rational at that point. So the rational empiric makes a very big assumption that we're dealing with rational, logical, non-emotive thinking and we're not necessarily. So the third one is the one I've always tried to go for, which is the educative leadership, <clears throat> which is where the people are part of the solution. Um, you, 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 along with the people that you're working with, identify the problem and then together work through ways that you can approach that. In that way, you're empowering people to have some ownership of, of that change and it's not something that is imposed on them from on high or that they're meant to think is a good thing simply because you've persuaded them it is. So I think that educative leadership is something that I would advise aspiring leaders to try to aim for rather than either of the other two because uh, in periods of change, people are going to respond in many and varied ways and you have to be prepared for that. Dr Lorraine, I really want to thank you for your time and sharing your wisdom with us today. And I look forward to the next book when it comes out. Okay, well, we'll work on it for you, Craig, and thank you. I've really enjoyed talking to you.